All right, good morning. My name is Rachel DePaus, and I teach middle school language arts and math randomly uh, at San Jose Christian, which is a small private school in Campbell uh, down in San Jose. And I'm really excited to share with you guys today about spoken word poetry. Um, this is something that my students have uh, created. It's basically a way for me to brag about how awesome middle school students are and how underutilized they are in being a voice for our society and creating social change. Uh, and so I'm really excited to share their story and our story uh, with you today. Uh, you'll see the session resources are up here uh, at this link, uh, and I invite you to follow along, um, but also just sit back and enjoy um, the process that we have gone through. It's going to be a little bit interactive. It's weird because I'm on stage. Usually I'm like working down there with you. Um, and so please ask questions if you have them and I will definitely um, jump down at some point and interact with you a little bit more. Also, um, you might notice I'm a little bit of a Michigan fan. Um, I'm excited uh, to be a Wolverine representing here even though our football team is not doing super well this year. Uh, we're more than a football team. Um, so go blue. So. Um, Today, I am just going to start with a video, and I just want you to watch to start. This is one of my students' spoken word creations, and I'm going to kind of go through the process that we have done as uh, viewers at the end. Uh, so we're going to go through the end process and then step back and do the full process. In all the movies, the girl princes want to save is always this gorgeous princess, and all the girl clicks always swoon over this handsome boy that winks at them. All the popular girls wear overdoses of makeup and seem to be the one everyone hangs out with. Then there's this other girl sitting by a bench by herself, watching them all talking happily together with sad eyes. Ever seen her? She's at every school, at every corner, in every mall, just longing to be like them. Because in her eyes, she's the ugly little duckling following the rest of her brothers and sisters. She's the Dumbo that everyone laughs at for having huge ears too big for her body. When people hear those names they've grown up with, they seem to just speak what first comes to their mind. Oh, Cinderella? That maid who worked like a slave for her stepmother and two sisters? The Beauty and the Beast? You mean that story about the pretty girl who gets imprisoned in the big ugly monster's castle? Oh, her? That girl who sits by herself every day? They don't know the real story. In the end, what happens to the characters? The ugly duckling becomes a white swan. Dumbo learns to fly and is loved in the circus. Cinderella found someone at the ball who loved her, and the beast fell in love with Belle and turned back into a handsome prince. That girl sitting by herself is just like one of them. She's a caterpillar just waiting for her time to turn into a butterfly, a wilting flower waiting for rain. In your opinion, she may not be as pretty as you on the outside, but how hard is it, really, just to try to see the inside? A seventh grader came up with those words, uh, came up with bringing in those images, came up, up with that creativity and shared that with her class. Um, and after we watched that in class, we picked up this Google form. And this is linked on the website um, as a spoken word response if you want to click on it there. But I would love for you to go to this link and just give uh, Ashley some simple feedback. Um, so whose poem did you watch? You watched Ashley's. Um, and then what are the top three words that you think about when you think about Ashley's video that you just experienced? Uh, and what other comments or suggestions or responses would you have for her? So I'm going to give you about two minutes to just fill out that form really quickly. Uh, you can go to this link or click again on it on my website. So to me, half of the beauty came through the process of creating these spoken words. Um, probably not even half, actually. The most defining part was this after process. So after we watched these videos, uh, we spent probably three or four days in class just going through every person's spoken word poem videos and giving them this feedback. Uh, so they started, after we watched it, they had complete silence, uh, which had very little to do with my classroom management techniques and very much to do uh, with their classmates sharing their hearts, and they just shared via a Google form. Uh, but then the power really came um, when I opened it up to verbal feedback. And um, really just stressing this intentional and specific feedback, uh, we spoke directly to Ashley about the things that we saw in her video. And those are probably the three most defining days of my entire teaching career thus far. Because all of a sudden, uh, people were saying specific things to these seventh graders 
they were talking to each other about specific things that they appreciated. And um, I just remember this one girl crying as her classmates gave her positive feedback, both about her topic and about her video. And so students were able to say things like, um, Ashley, like, I really appreciated the way that you brought in all these Disney characters who seemed like they had a lot of flaws, uh, but in the end, you really just showed us that, no, that's not how it ends in the world. Um, and so we have to think about how, how is our future really going to uh, overpower our now. And so just the way that uh, these classmates kind of spent some time uh, loving on each other and building community in that way uh, and building uh, that intentional and specific feedback. Uh, and I'm usually the type of teacher that's like, okay, I want to get through this and this and this and this, and I want to learn this and this and this. And to me, uh, it's easier for me when students turn in projects to just move on, right? I'm going to grade them and I'm going to move on. Um, but this project has really taught me the importance of slowing down and giving students the space to share those projects uh, and to give feedback to one another. So throughout this process of watching these videos, it really changed us as a class community. Uh, it changed the way that we had relationships with one another because all of a sudden we knew these deep parts about each other's hearts uh, instead of just what we see on the outside. We realized uh, that we're more than just the facade that we keep up. Um, it really changed sorry, me as a teacher um, in the way that I view my students. I think it's easy to be like, oh yeah, middle school pro students, like they have problems, but really are they problems, let's be honest. Um, but it really helped me understand the depth of the middle school uh, experience, which uh, is getting farther and farther away from me, and so it's hard to remember a lot of times. Um, and I think it really changed our view of the world as students started to create these videos that, um, and these spoken word poems that really showed really what's going on in the world, and that our, our view is quite small. Uh, living in San Jose, California, like everything's right there. It's the best, that's why I live there. Um, but really that the world is a bigger place and there are way bigger problems than what we're dealing with on a daily basis. Uh, but I didn't start in the best place. Uh, I had very humble beginnings with poetry and I think that uh, these clips from Dead Poet Society kind of bring that to light. To fully understand poetry, we must first be fluent with its meter, rhyme, and figures of speech, then ask two questions. One, how artfully has the objective of the poem been rendered, and two, how important is that objective? Question one rates the poem's perfection, question two rates its importance. And once these questions have been answered, determining the poem's greatness becomes a relatively simple matter. So I went to college and studied English, and I felt like poetry was just a bunch of BS. Like, I'm just going to pull things out of nowhere and write these papers, and it's boring, and yeah, it's easy to decipher, but not really. And I was really lost on what to do. Uh, and so I was a little bit like Mr. Keating in that. Excrement. That's what I think of Mr. J. Evans Pritchard. We're not laying pipe. We're talking about poetry. How can you describe poetry like American bandstand? Well, I like Byron. I give him a 42, but I can't <laughs> dance to him. Now, I want you to rip out that page. Go on. Rip out the entire page. You heard me. Rip it out. Rip it out! Go on. Rip it out! Thank you, Mr. Dalton. And so that's what I did. I um, just decided I wasn't going to teach poetry because I felt like I don't know how to make it interesting. It's kind of boring. It's kind of a little bit of everywhere. And so I just didn't teach it. Uh, and we all know that that doesn't always work. What the hell is going on here? I don't hear enough rip. Mr. Keating. Mr. McAllister. I'm sorry, I, I didn't know you were here. I am. Ah, so you are. Excuse me. Because we do have an administrator, right? And these administrators want to keep us accountable for actually teaching what we're supposed to teach. And my administrator at the time was a former AP English teacher. And so he was very passionate about poetry and using that poetry um, to inspire kids and um, give them all this stuff. And I was like, I don't understand how that's even possible. I think poetry is boring. Uh, and uh, I, wanted to be, I wanted to understand poetry like this. This is a battle. 
A war. And the casualties could be your hearts and souls. Thank you, Mr. Dalton. Armies of academics going forward, measuring poetry. No! You'll not have that here. No more of Mr. J. Evans' pitching. Now, my class, you will learn to think for yourselves again. You will learn to savor words and language. No matter what anybody tells you, words and ideas can change the world. Now, see that look in Mr. Pitt's eye, like 19th century literature, has nothing to do with going to business school or medical school, right? Maybe. Mr. Hopkins, you may agree with him, thinking, yes, we should simply study our Mr. Pritchard and learn our rhyme and meter and go quietly about the business of achieving other ambitions. I have a little secret for you. Huddle up. Huddle up! We don't read and write poetry because it's cute. We read and write poetry because we are members of the human race. And the human race is filled with passion. And medicine, law, business, engineering, these are noble pursuits and necessary to sustain life. But poetry, beauty, romance, love, these are what we stay alive for. And that's what I wanted my students to experience, and that's what spoken word poetry has allowed my students and myself to understand. Um, and that I really found on YouTube. I don't know if any of you went to Lisa Highfield's session yesterday on YouTube, but she is like the YouTube goddess. I want to be her when I grow up. And she really encouraged me a couple of years ago at this conference to start curating my own resources on YouTube. And there are so many spoken word videos on YouTube. Um, I don't know if you uh, even ever see them on Facebook, right? That's where I find most of my content for the class, uh, this class. Um, and I began curating a playlist of all of these different YouTube spoken word videos of people uh, performing. Because as much as I would love to be able to perform like them, I'm just not as great. But this was um, made it able for me to bring in all of these professionals into my classroom. Uh, and so when my students see Sarah Kay's If I Should Have a Daughter, uh, their jaws drop to the floor when they understand that this is actually what poetry can be. If I should have a daughter, instead of mom, she's going to call me point B. Because that way she knows that no matter what happens, at least she can always find her way to me. And I'm going to paint the solar systems on the backs of her hands. So she has to learn the entire universe before she can say, oh, I know that like the back of my hand. And she's going to learn that this life will hit you hard in the face, wait for you to get back up just so it can kick you in the stomach. But getting the wind knocked out of you is the only way to remind your lungs how much they like the taste of air. There is hurt here that cannot be fixed by band-aids or poetry. So the first time she realizes that Wonder Woman isn't coming, I'll make sure she knows she doesn't have to wear the cape all by herself. Because no matter how wide you stretch your fingers, your hands will always be too small to catch all the pain you want to heal. Believe me, I've tried. And baby, I'll tell her, don't keep your nose up in the air like that. I know that trick. I've done it a million times. You're just smelling for smoke, so you can follow the trail back to a burning house so you can find the boy who lost everything in the fire to see if you can save him. Or else, find the boy who lit the fire in the first place to see if you can change him. But I know she will anyway, so instead, I'll always keep an extra supply of chocolate and rain boots nearby, because there is no heartbreak that chocolate can't fix. Okay, there's a few heartbreaks that chocolate can't fix, but that's what the rain boots are for, because rain will wash away everything if you let it. I want her to look at the world through the underside of a glass bottom boat, to look through a microscope at the galaxies that exist on the pinpoint of a human mind, because that's the way my mom taught me, that there'll be days like this, there'll be days like this, my mama said. When you open your hands to catch, I'll wind up with only blisters and bruises. When you step out of the phone booth and try to fly, and the very people you want to save are the ones standing on your cape. When your boots will fill with rain and you'll be up to your knees in disappointment, and those are the very days you have all the more reason to say thank you. Because there's nothing more beautiful than the way the ocean refuses to stop kissing the shoreline, no matter how many times it's sent away. You will put the wind in winsome, 
lose some. You will put the star in starting over and over. And no matter how many landmines erupt in a minute, be sure your mind lands on the beauty of this funny place called life. And yes, on a scale from one to over-trusting, I am pretty damn naive. But I want her to know that this world is made out of sugar. It can crumble so easily, but don't be afraid to stick your tongue out and taste it. Baby, I'll tell her, remember your mama is a worrier and your papa is a warrior and you are the girl with small hands and big eyes who never stops asking for more. Remember that good things come in threes and so do bad things and always apologize when you've done something wrong, but don't you ever apologize for the way your eyes refuse to stop shining. Your voice is small, but don't ever stop singing. And when they finally hand you heartache, when they slip war and hatred under your door and offer you handouts on street corners of cynicism and defeat, you tell them that they really ought to meet your mother. And so we spend the entire unit basically watching, the, watching these mentor texts, and we spend time analyzing them. And so this first day, I show them three or four different spoken word poems, and the first time, they just watch it. The second time, they watch it with this form open. And it's a very simple form. It says, how much did you like it on a scale to 10, one to 10, and what are two things you liked and two things you didn't like? And we spend time looking at these different poems and thinking about what are the aspects that we enjoy and which ones are the ones that distract us from the overall message. And as we go, we look at kind of three distinct areas. We think, what are, what are the actual words that this poet is saying? And are those words compelling? Then we talk about what is the visual element that we see? What, what is our screen looking at? Is it that somebody's talking with their hands or is it an actual picture? What does that look like? And then finally, what's the background audio that we're listening to as it goes on? And we talk about how um, these things really create mood within us. And we talk about how sometimes the audio and the visual make it so, yeah, we are enjoying watching it, but do we hear their message? No. And so we have a lot of questions about different visual literacy and media literacy. Um, there, on the resources, there's a document called Media Literacy Questions, which has been a great conversation for us of thinking about, well, who made this spoken word poem? What's their agenda in it? Uh, and so lots of great uh, conversations that fit with the Common Core for sure, um, but also just uh, make our students understand how to engage with their world, which I'm really passionate about. Um, and so each video, uh, it's really the easiest unit ever to teach because I do very little grading. We just have conversation about it. And the students are so interested by the messages that these poets are performing that they want to participate. It's uh, a very vocal time in my classroom. So I'm going to give you a little bit of time to look at these mentor texts just for yourself, to see the ones um, that you think are interesting to you, maybe do some research on your own. Um, this is kind of a for sure, for sure, for sure, you need to preview any video before you show it in class, um, especially these spoken word poems. Uh, I love spoken word poetry, but there are a lot of spoken word poets um, who are definitely not appropriate for my middle schoolers um, or even for a, a lot of high schoolers. And so thinking about what is appropriate, um, like you saw with Sarah Kay, uh, she did swear in it, um, but for me, it's okay for me to show that to my kids in middle school. But thinking about who are your learners and what's appropriate for them, both in um, subject area and uh, time for them to um, what they can digest. Um, so I'm going to give you about five minutes just to play. If you want to click on my um, link to mentor text or if you just want to play on YouTube, um, I'll pop down there and ask any questions, answer any questions that you have as well. All right, so as you can see, it's really easy to get sucked into these videos. Um, I can easily spend an entire evening just watching spoken word poetry. Um, and I, my students can too. Uh, I cannot believe how many of my students, when I don't assign it as homework, tell me like, oh, Ms. Deepouts, I spent the entire night last night watching spoken word. <laughs> I'm like, are you serious? <laughs> That's amazing. Or um, I don't know if any of you have heard of uh, the program We Day that happens every year for students. Um, it kind of celebrates them serving. Uh, last year, um, my students went to We Day and they came back and they were like, Miss Deepouse, there was somebody performing spoken word poetry. It was so cool. Um, and just their excitement of that and um, to me, kind of their pride also that they have created something similar. 
Uh, and so we talk about well, what's in common with all of these videos. We spend two weeks watching videos. If you look on um, the website, there's my unit plan there uh, from last year. And we talk about, well, what's in common? What makes these spoken word poetry uh, videos so powerful? And we come up with passion. Um, it doesn't necessarily matter if we are passionate about the same subject that they are. Uh, it just matters to us that those people are passionate about what they're passionate about. Um, and in a society where apathy is uh, li alive and well, it's so great for these students to understand the power that passion really has. Uh, and so uh, one of those days we had a chapel and um, the person from We Day came and they were talking about this equation right here. She was talking about how a person's passion combined with an issue can really create change in our world. Um, so she was challenging students to think about, okay, I love playing soccer. How can I use that soccer idea to raise money or awareness for human trafficking? Well, I could throw a soccer tournament. So that's great, um, and I think that's definitely something my students can do, but within that, we started to think about, well, what would it mean to make our spoken word poems about this idea? What would it mean to bring in our passion for an issue to create change in our world? Um, and how do we do that uh, within the context of our curriculum? Because uh, we still need to teach students things. Um, and so we had a lot of great dialogue uh, that really created these videos to be about social change in our world. Um, so maybe if you teach history, it's about war and the effects of war. And students are creating spoken word poems uh, about war and how maybe they want war to stop. Or maybe they're doing it about a past war and what the people felt. And they're trying to create some empathy for those people. Um, maybe if you teach science, you could talk about pollution or um, our drought right now. Thank God for the rain, right? Um, how, how could we bring in those issues of our curriculum that we're already studying and empower students to create social change? Uh, or maybe if you do math, you could talk about uh, our budget as the United States and you could bring that in and encourage students to think through those questions. Um, maybe if you uh, teach art, it's about, well, how can I, what is art even? What does that look like? How can I use art to create a positive difference in my world? Um, or even if it's just about life. Um, I think, especially, this is why I love teaching language arts, I get the opportunity and the freedom to allow my students to just explore life and communicate about life. Um, and so uh, there are just so many topics that your students can write about and um, maybe even giving them an umbrella and say, okay, I want you to think about this general topic, but create um, some of the social awareness within that topic. And so this is basically my unit plan for how, or project plan rather, for how I wanted them to create. So the first thing I asked them to do was write their poem. And I don't know about you, but creativity for me is really hard to do right on the spot. Uh, and so this is something that I assigned at the beginning of the unit. And I said, you have the next two weeks to write a poem. I'm not gonna give you time in class because I think writing poetry in class is really difficult. Um, but sometime over the next week, I want you to write a poem about some of that passion plus issue equals change. How can you use your passion to attack an issue that you see in the world? It can be a big issue in the world or it can just be um, in your small world that you're a part of right here. Um, so you have two weeks to do that. Uh, I said it has to be at least 10 lines. So m many students went way above that 10 line uh, requirement, but that's what they had to at least uh, have. And then we spent a lot of time getting feedback Okay, what could I change in my poem? How could I make it flow better? Um, I'm really about creating a culture uh, uh, in my classroom where it's all about feedback. That's why I love Google Apps for Education. So my students wrote it in Google Docs and continually got feedback, but then they also read it aloud to people uh, because spoken word poetry is meant to be spoken. Uh, and so we spent a lot of time thinking about, okay, how's my feedback or how does my poem flow? What does that look like? And then they had to plan their visual element. And they had to think about how am I going to be on the screen in order to portray my message. It could just be me. I can be speaking, but if I'm speaking, I better not just stand here like this and speak like that. Um, we need to think about how can we use hand motions or our facial expressions in order to, um, to create this. Or they could do bring in pictures that are Creative Commons licensed, or they could film it. And so um, I'll show some examples in a little bit that have a lot of those different elements. And then we spent a lot of time practicing because spoken word poetry needs practice. 
Um, and I believe in spending class time to practice speaking these poems because my students learned how to be way more confident speakers as they practice this poetry. They learned how to speak with passion. They learned how to, to emphasize their words. Um, and they grew in confidence as they practiced with one another. So it maybe started as just, I'm gonna go out and talk to myself, um, but then it's maybe a partner, then a small group, and just growing that confidence in what they were saying. Um, and then I just tell them, make magic happen. Um, I tell my kids all the time, do something awesome to show me this. Uh, and just giving them the freedom to do that. So when we write our poem, I, I encourage them to think, well, what irks you? Uh, if you were gonna make a bug list of everything that bothers you, uh, what would you say? Uh, sorry, that's kind of small. What problems need solving? What do you see in our world as a problem? Uh, people don't ask middle schoolers that question near often enough. Uh, they are very uh, perceptive of their world. Uh, what awareness needs to be raised? And what legacy do you want to leave behind? Um, if you're going to create this video, what do you want people to know that you are passionate about? Um, and so as I was doing this, I was thinking about how maybe I could create an example. And I was reading their essays on an airplane ride back to Michigan to visit my parents. And I was overwhelmed by the comma splice. So I'm going to share with you my poem about the plight of the comma splice, because the struggle is real, people. The struggle is real. So this is um, the example of some that I wrote. I said, the plight, the plight, oh, the plight of the comma splice. In every stack of essays, we find this, act, this epidemic. Its purpose? To ruin the days of each and every academic. The plight, the plight, oh, the plight of the comma splice. It comes when you least expect it, right in the middle of a phrase causing such a chasm in its split that you can't help but feel crazed. The plight, the plight, oh, the plight of the comma splice. And so I can't help but wonder just how to cure this oh-so-common plunder and my grating sanity ensure. The plight, the plight, oh, the plight of the comma splice. The solution really is quite simple. If you just think things through, just look for the comma signal and bid all extra marks adieu. The plight, the plight, oh, the plight of the comma splice. Can your two phrases stand alone? Don't splice them with a comma. Relationships must be precisely shown. Semicolons solve separation trauma. The plight, the plight, oh, the plight of the comma splice. But if two independent clauses are joined together by a conjunction, then place a comma where one pauses to avoid a comma malfunction. The plight, the plight, oh, the plight of the comma splice. So would you pretty please think your comma usage through? If not for you, then to me appease. For only with your help can we undo the plight, the plight. Oh, the plight of the comma splice. And so it's really fun to just show the kids like, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> These are things I care about. <laughs> like, think things through just for my sanity, please. Um, and I do think that is a very important problem in our world. Um, but thinking um, just how we can even write with our students and encourage them in that area. Uh, and really, I just give them a few guidelines. Um, so this is my rubric. This is about as close to a rubric as I get because I hate them. Um, <laughs> and uh, we talk about, OK, the big chunk of your grade is your, por your poem performance. So I used to say, your poem has to be memorized. And they're like, Ms. Deepout, if we are hiding behind our screen, how are you going to know that we memorized it? And I was like, OK, good point. So I'm going to say it has to be memorized. And by that, I mean it has to sound like you know what you're talking about. You have to sound very fluid um, in your memorization. Um, we talk about how it needs to have really good tempo and pauses and varied volume. Um, in some of our poems, we, I actually print them out and we label them like a piece of music. We write the crescendos and the decrescendos. We write the staccato notes um, and talk about how and why people do that. Why do people repeat things? Um, why is there a chorus in the plight of the comma splice? Um, we talk about uh, enunciation. We talk about uh, rhythm and being fluid and having either hand gestures or a fluid piece of uh, pictures that really flow with our message and how that can add to it or really easily distract. Um, we talk, um, and I say, your performance has to add to the understanding in some way. That's a big chunk of the grade. Um, and so that's a lot of points for them. Uh, and so I say, this is 40 test points, 40 assessment points. 
your video quality is only 10 points. Um, and so we have a lot of conversations about which one do you think I actually care about more? Do I care that you can make an amazing video? Well, yeah, sort of. I do care that you can communicate in that way. But really what's important to me is that the, the spoken word part of it is impactful, that it's powerful. Um, and so uh, I go back to this every single class period. This is what I care about. This is what I care about. This is what I care about. Um, and uh, then I basically just let them loose. And I just encourage them every day to think about what are your word quality, uh, what's the visual component, and what is your background music going to be or your background uh, musical quality? And how can those add to the understanding instead of detracting from it? And then I basically just let them work. And if you haven't used Class Dojo, um, I'm a Class Dojo fangirl. They uh, are such an easy way to track participation in your class. Um, so as my classroom has shifted over the past four years, um, my participation grade is a huge part of my class period now. And so I can choose students and I can say that they either um, participate in a positive way or a negative way. And then it creates a graph for me and percentages for me of how much positive or negative participation my kids have. And I just plug that into my grade book as the participation grade. And the parents and the students can track it. And it's really cool because overall, like 96% of the participation I track is positive. And kids are thriving off of that positive feedback. So definitely check them out if you have it. Um, and so uh, I'm going to just kind of show you a couple examples now of the way that this can look like uh, with seventh grade students and um, just the power of giving them that freedom and empowering them uh, to share their voice. She built her walls up so high, closed off from the world, truly broken inside. Her mind filled with all those lies that ripped her apart from the inside, always wondering why she could never be the perfect size. No matter what she did, she was never seen as good enough, never really had anyone she could call friends. So she decided that she would pretend to be tough, to pretend like words didn't hurt her. But really, she was truly broken inside, smiling on the outside, dying on the inside. All she wanted was to feel like she belonged, for someone to understand her feelings, maybe even someone she could call friend. She didn't get real friends until later in life, but what happens if this little girl decided to end her life, just thought she was better dead than alive? Her death would have hurt more people than she could ever realize. To this day, she is glad she stayed strong, even though she was wronged. She had her childhood taken away from her. She has scars that can never be removed, and it was all because of hurtful words. Although those memories are her worst nightmare, she's glad she never tried to commit suicide, and is able to tell her story, even though it is long, in order to help those around her to stay strong. That video changed our classroom as we, again, spent the time to give Alexis feedback and tell her how much she is loved by us and what it looks like for her to be a part of our community. Um, and her willingness to share that with us and, and just the power of those words um, to be able to share. It's just pictures from the internet. That's all the visual quality is, uh, but we don't care. And then that combined with her bringing in pictures of her and her actual friends um, just creates such power. Um, and then other ones are uh, a little bit um, uh, a little bit different. They have um, why? Why people. do we insist on being so violent? Why do we walk out of our house every single day, see nothing but violence and fighting? Why is it that when you're walking down the street, all that you see is people fighting over some useless thing like who won last night's football game, whether or not a bike has four or five gears? Why? Why do we do this every single day of our life as a way of saying you're smart and others are stupid? To let them know that you're right and they're wrong? Or is it just you saying that you are the best because you pay attention to some things and others pay attention to others? You do it just because it makes you feel powerful to fight with others? But I ask you to take a step back and ask yourself this. What am I really accomplishing by having this fight? What does this do to help me have a better life? Well, I can tell you, it won't do anything. By the time that you turn 30, if you get your first job, no one will care if you want to fight against your brother or beat your friend in an arm wrestling contest. So why? Why do we insist on being so violent and fighting with everyone we see? I ask you, 
why? Talk about being convicted by a seventh grader. <laughs> um, and just those conversations that we are able to have as a class uh, out of his uh, view of the world. And um, not anything I directed, just his own thoughts. Um, other ones are, um, this is a student who has in the past struggled with English. And just to see him be successful in telling a, a story through spoken word poetry uh, was really powerful for me. The world is full of opportunities. Some people take them, some don't, but there are others that just try. The world here is a world full of people that don't think people can do it. Others say that you can. Other people just try. Some succeed, some don't. This world is constantly changing because of opportunity. Opportunity does not just sit there. It takes people on different paths. Opportunity is a tool. People can choose to use it or not to use it. It is there, waiting for people to grab it. You either choose to take it or not take it. Some lead to great things. Some are bad things. Even during this time, this can lead people into different paths. So I love this project because it's accessible for all of my learners. Um, and to, for him to hear from his classmates positive things that he's done in English uh, just continued to build that confidence. Uh, and not all of my videos were amazing, right? Um, there are always uh, outliers on both ends. Um, and so just to give you a little piece of not everything's amazing, I'm not up here because I'm amazing and can make students be perfect. Um, by any means, here's a little slice of a not so amazing. Friends a very important thing in life. What if there's no such thing as friends? The world would not be what it is now. The world have no technology. Gasp. Thankfully, friends do exist. We need to care about them. Why? We need to care about them because God wants them to be the way they are right now. We should make our friends feel like they can trust us. Our friends need us to look out for them as they do to us. Friends might get into fights, but they should never hold a grudge. They should always make up. Friends are wonderful and a great asset in life. So, I mean, his expression, right, really convinces you about these friends. Um, but we were able to have a lot of those conversations even in the post-viewing process. Hey, do you see uh, the dichotomy between what you created and what other people created? Um, and just to be able to continually have those conversations about how do we portray ourselves and how do we communicate our message, which to me, language arts isn't about reading and writing anymore. It's about communicating and um, understanding the things that we come in contact with. Um, and then this last one is one of my top two favorites um, of just how a, um, this girl uh, began to understand what human trafficking really was and uh, just developed a passion for stopping that and for spreading awareness. Do you hear what I hear? I hear cries of agony and help from children that are so near, wanting to escape the chains holding them back in fear. Oh, how they want mommy and daddy to hold them dear, that can't happen because human trafficking exists. Holding people of all ages by shackles on their wrists, clenching their hands into fists, wondering what did I ever do to get myself into this twist? Trying, oh, they're trying to hold on and persist. No human, none at all, should be able to own another, from the little and small to the oldest of adults. No one should be held in thrall because they're forced into labor or prostitution or slavery. That's my final call. America, are you there? Listen as I speak and remember as I declare. Slavery didn't end with Abraham Lincoln or with Mr. King's cries of despair. It's still here today, everywhere. So don't continue reading your book or watching TV in a blank stare. Treating human beings whose lives are so precious is awfully unfair. What if I told you you could let them flee? Giving hope to the hopeless and letting the blind see. Showing the lost a way to new life. Speaking up for the voiceless just agree that no one should be held to lock and a key. Help me stand up for those who can't and make them feel like more than debris. Because we are not for sale and everyone should live free. Unless you think that we have all, uh, that that was all on professional video cameras and everything. She did that on her iPod. Um, and the things that students can do just on these devices that are in their pockets already um, is just so powerful to see, um, to see what can happen uh, when, when we empower students that their voice really matters. 
that they have a say in our society and that they can make a difference, that they can create social change. So really, I don't really do a whole lot in this unit. I just encourage my students to be true to who they are and to the, be true to the voices um, and the things that they see in the world. And so really, this is just the process. They write their poem, they get feedback, they plan some visual element, uh, they practice, and then they make magic happen. And um, just the results that I've seen uh, in their confidence, but also just in their ability uh, to share their message with the world has been really powerful. Um, so I just want to point you one last time, um, if you go to uh, this website, there's a ton of resources there for you. Um, I put uh, the, the unit plan that I used last year and which videos I used, um, but also just giving students the time to explore the videos for themselves and think about which ones they would want to use. Um, so feel free to use any of those resources. Um, I also recommend even make a film festival out of it. Give students awards for the best, uh, the best visual element, the best poem element. Um, think about how we can continually uh, give students uh, this, this confidence in who they are and that their voice matters. Um, and so uh, that will continue to be up there forever. So, well, maybe not forever, but for a long time. Um, and so thank you very much for your time. Uh, please let me know if you have any questions that I can answer. And if your students do this, please share. Um, I would love to uh, be a sharer of their work as well, and um, both through the internet or whatever the case may be. Uh, but please reach out to me via email or Twitter uh, with any questions that you have throughout the process. So thank you.